Hello, I'm Michelle Paver and um, we're going out live on Facebook. Sorry for the slight technical hitch. Uh, we lost our sound. Um, anyway, this evening, just for about half an hour, I'm going to be talking about writing about the natural world. I'm going to mention a couple of books which do it really well, in my opinion. And then we've got loads of your questions. There's some really great ones. Uh, but before I start, just to remind you that if you want to post a comment or ask a question, um, please go to my website, michellepaver.com slash ask. Um, as some of you probably know, I'm not very good at responding to uh, posts on Facebook um, or YouTube, but if you really want to make sure that I will answer your question or comment, um, that's the way to do it. Fill in the form on my website, michellepaver.com slash ask. Um, so without further ado, writing about the natural world. Well, I suppose the most important thing um, I would say, which is pretty obvious, but it bears repeating, is if you're writing about somewhere natural, try to go there. Uh, now, that's easier said than done. Um, if it's a wood, OK, that's fine. You can probably find a wood somewhere near you or even just a tree in a supermarket car park. You know, it doesn't have to be huge. You use your imagination. That's what writers do. Um, a live volcano, that's a bit trickier but it can be done. I've done it. But I think the important thing, one of the important things when you, you go into your chosen location um, is try to experience what your character's experiencing. Try to imagine how they're feeling because they're going to notice different things depending on how they're feeling. Um, Torak, when his father's just been killed by the bear in Wolf Brother, he notices different things about the forest because he's alone for the first time. Um, that's quite different from what he'd notice when he's just having a nice walk with Wolf and feeling really good. So it's really useful to, to think from, from your character's point of view. Um, I did that um, up in the Arctic when I was researching my ghost story, Dark Matter. I was halfway through the book and I Jack, my character, was very much with me. And it gave me ideas because mm. there was a full moon and you're so I was so far north that the, the moon didn't set. But then occasionally these inky clouds would come across the moon. And in my story, that's really scary because it's when it's dark and there's no moonlight that the ghost comes out. So I started getting really anxious and I kept watching the sky. And that gave me ideas for the story. So you get ideas for the story when you go out um, thinking like your character and feeling what they're feeling into the location where it's all, where the story is taking place. Um, I don't actually take many photos. Um, I do have a little phone which can take photos, so it's quite useful to photograph a plant if I want to identify it. But I don't take them as a way of recording the landscape because it, it doesn't when you think about it. What's, what's really important is what it feels like, what it smells like, what it sounds like. So I take a notebook, lots and lots of notes, because as I say, I get ideas when I'm in the landscape. It's always amazing what ideas I get, sometimes for the whole plot as well. Um, so that's just a little, oh yes, the other thing I was gonna say is, um, you wanna do this carefully, but sometimes I take a bit of it home with me. Um, now of course you can't if it's a, a wildlife reserve or um, and you're not allowed to dig up plants in most countries because that's against the rules, rightly so. Um, yeah, I wouldn't want to take a squirrel home with me, but I did take a bit of antler home with me because, you know, reindeer antler is pretty common stuff. This is from Greenland. I picked up a piece. I got someone to saw off the, the biggest pieces because, you know, I just wanted a smallish piece. But it's it's really, it reminds me of that place. And it's also, of course, an incredibly useful tool for Torak. But it keeps me in touch with it and it lies on my desk and it just reminds me of it. Um, something else. This is a falcon feather. This is about 35 years old. Um, I picked this up and somehow it has still survived. I picked this up on a Greek island, Elonisos. Um, I think it was the first time I'd been to that island on my own. I hadn't written, I hadn't been published at the time, but I just took notes and I picked up this falcon feather because there were these beautiful falcons circling above the, um, the cliffs. And that's been on my desk ever since. And it stayed with me. And then years later, when I wrote Gods and Warriors, it gave me the idea for Echo the Falcon. So that, that can help. Um, 
So that's just a little bit about writing about the natural world. A couple of books that I, I think do it really, really well. Um, it probably won't surprise you that um, one of them is The Lord of the Rings. Um, he does have a way with describing. He really does. And creating a feeling of the natural world. But I think he's wonderful on trees. And I realised when I was looking for a, a bit to read you that there was one bit in particular that I, I wanted to find because it made a huge impression on me. It's only a few lines, but um, I think it really feeds into my feeling for the forest. And it's when Frodo, if you know the story, is in Lothlorien. Um, and he's just about to climb a ladder up a tree with some elves. Um, he laid his hand upon the tree beside the ladder. Never before had he been so suddenly and so keenly aware of the feel and texture of a tree's skin and of the life within it. He felt a delight in wood and the touch of it, neither as forester nor as carpenter. It was the delight of the living tree itself. It made a big impression on me. So you see, you don't, you don't need great long descriptions. Sometimes it's just a tiny little sentence or two that will really lodge in the reader's mind. It's certainly lodged in my mind. Um, and the other book that you may not know so well is The Winter Book by Tova Janssen. Some of you may have read Tova Janssen's wonderful moving books. I certainly did. And they have a tremendous feel of the forest and the sea. And, um, they're wonderful and the islands of Sweden. Um, but The Winter Book is a collection of short stories. And again, she has this very deceptively simple style. It's very difficult to do. And there's a wonderful story about um, a squirrel. And it's, she's a writer on an island, a very small island. And uh, she, she writes about writing brilliantly. And then this squirrel turns up. And there's an amazing relationship between her and the squirrel. Um, I think that's a grey squirrel. It was actually a red squirrel, but I will not shoot my agent. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My poor agent, he has to produce these pictures at a moment's notice. Um, the, the, the bit I want to read you is actually from another uh, story, um, and I'm sorry there isn't a picture for this, but it's probably just as well because it's just a, a little piece. It's called The Iceberg, and it's she's a child, and she's with her parents in a little rowing boat because they're rowing out to an island where they're going to spend the summer, but it's still spring, and they come across a small iceberg. And it's this is just a couple of lines, but... It was green and white and sparkling, and it was coming in order to meet me. I had never seen an iceberg before. So it was coming in order to meet me. So she sort of personified the iceberg, and that's something I think you can do. I'm just dropping my book. Um, you have a choice. You know, sometimes you can experience the, the landscape, whatever it is about the natural world you're trying to, through your character. But you can also make... The, the landscape itself, the feature, a character, like I did with the forest in Chronicles of Ancient Darkness. Um, the mountain, Kanchenjunga, in Thin Air, I kind of approached it as if it's a character, and that helped me bring out the feelings about it, because it's all about feeling, as with all other aspects of writing. So now we come to the reader's questions. Um, this is my favourite bit because you've done the hard work. All I've got to do is answer the questions. Before I move into the first question, I just want to refer back to something, one, a couple of questions uh, from last time. Gracie and Liam were asking me about Far's knife, and I gave a long description of the knife, but then I forgot, and I'd actually written this down, but I just wanted to make the point that you know, Far's knife is a sort of a single piece of slate, so I'd given you a sort of picture of it. Um, but then I think in a previous MP Live, I had talked about microliths, these sort of little flakes of flint which they would set, Torex people would set in a slit piece of antler, for example, a bit like the knife that um, uh, Finkedin makes for Torek in book two. And you may have been confused by that. You may be thinking, well, wait a minute, she's just talked about microliths, these flakes of flint, and now we've got Far's knife, which is just one piece of slate. Well, that's because Far is a mage or was a mage. So he had a rather special knife as mages did, and I forgot to mention it. So as soon as I logged off or whatever last time, I thought, oh, no, I forgot it. Anyway, moving on, um, the questions. First of all, we have one from David. Um, yeah, this is interesting. Where do you write? Uh, and David is is a hardliner. He writes in, he has written in a windowless loft space with an oil lamp. Um, that's 
great. And actually, I, I know some writers, I think Stephen King likes to write, you know, facing a, a wall um, with earphones on and heavy metal or rock or something, just shutting out the world. Everybody's different. I'm not like that. I write in my study, which is on the first floor, and my 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 desk is in a bay window overlooking a meadow and then woods behind. Um, so I can see kestrels and sometimes owls and crows and dogs being walked and things, and I actually like that. I like to be able to see the sky and the weather. Um, but then my computer is to the right, and then that's just facing a blank wall, but then I can still see the, the sky and things like that. I should say, I am not in my study now. Where I am talking to you is in my spare room because this the, the internet is in the ghetto. It's sort of shoved up in the spare room in a corner where I can't see it from the rest of the house. I do not write on this computer. Um, that's because I'm very hardline about distraction in another way. So I don't have email. Um, that's why the only way you can reach me is through my website. What I actually write on is my computer on the first floor in that study, as I mentioned, and um, okay, I have the window and I have the woods, but that's a standalone computer. It's nearly 20 years old and I write on an ancient program. Actually, my floppy disk drive has just died, so I, I don't even back up anymore. I just print hard copies. Um, so it's a very ancient standalone computer and my mobile is on silent. So no distractions and no internet distractions. And that to me is really, really important. Um, so... Next question. Um, Terry, yes, this is from California. Great. A novice writer, what's the most important advice you can give someone? Um, oh, that's really difficult. I can't pick one thing because to me, writing is like spinning plates. You know, they're all spinning at the same time. You've got to look at character and plot and pacing and description and exposition. What's the most important tip? This is going to sound boring. I'll try to make it interesting, but it is the importance of rewriting. I think the most important thing is if you can give yourself the luxury of putting your writing to one side for a few weeks, um, or if it's a long book, a novel, just move on with the story so and don't look at the first early chapter so that you've forgotten about it, because then you can come to it fresh, relatively fresh. You'll have forgotten what you wrote, and you will see all sorts of things that need doing to it. Um, I'm sure, excuse me while I just reach down, I'm sure I've shown you pictures uh, at manuscripts before, but, you know, just to show you again, here's, here's a, this is the only bit of manuscript that survives from Ghost Hunter, actually. It's, it's a chapter, it says there it's chapter 29, but actually I think it became 33 in the book. And it's, you know, scribbled all over. And then it's typed up here and it's scribbled all over. I mean... Rewriting is when the book starts to take shape. You've done all the hard work. Um, rewriting itself is very hard work. I'm doing it at the moment. I'm finishing it. I'm in the last two weeks of finishing a book. So it's incredibly tense, which is why I look quite tired. I'm not getting much sleep. But um, it's it's hugely fun. I think I said incredibly tense. It's not tense. It's just intense, hard work. Um, but to, to give you an example, it's not just about, you know, tightening the description you can make your story work harder for you. Uh, to give you an example from Wolf Brother, the first few drafts when we have the bit when Torak and Ren meet the walker, you know, this strange, filthy old man, he's very menacing. And to begin with, in the first few drafts, he was just waving his knife and sort of menacing them. It was only in the rewrite that I thought, well, okay, what if he grabs Ren's bow and he threatens to snap it in two? We've already established that she just, you know, her bow is her hunting partner. It's like a friend. She's going to go ballistic, and she does. But that didn't occur the first time I wrote that scene. That's why the rewrite is so important. You sort of tighten it, and then suddenly you realise, oh, you're making this this scene work in so many more different ways than just a straightforward confrontation. So, yeah, sorry, rewriting. Oh, and the other thing bearing in mind that you're a novice writer and you're from California, so you're probably on the internet a lot. This is going to sound very hard line, but try to mute your phone and try to ice the internet. Try to, because, you know, if you're getting emails and texts and things, you're going to be distracted. 
you're not going to be able to concentrate as much. Try to. There are programs, I believe. Uh, I know my sister has one that you know you can you can sort of program yourself to go offline for. You know you can choose how long, uh, two minutes or three hours or whatever. But try to distance yourself from distractions, like me. Um, anyway, moving on, Sally. Oh, this is this is just a lovely comment, actually. She's just read Th Thin Air, followed by Dark Matter. Both were absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really so glad. And you said you're looking forward to the next one. Um, well, that's the one I'm finishing now. So it's, it's a gothic one. So it's not quite ghostly, but it's a gothic one set in the Fens in Suffolk. So thank you for that. Very encouraging. Uh, Laurent, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, I've just finished Thin Air. This is the only book, aside from... At the Mountains of Madness, good one, that, that has genuinely scared me. Um, thank you. Brilliantly atmospheric and unnerving. Yay. Um, I like comments like that. Uh, Colton. Ah, yes. Now, this is a technical question, my favourite. Uh, are the Chronicles of Ancient Darkness books ever going to be on Kindle? Well, I am reliably informed by my agent um, that they are on Kindle. They're on both uh, Amazon.co.uk and Amazon.com. And I think, yes, he's just flashed up the page now. Um, but if you or anybody can't find them or if you're having difficulties, uh, please do get in touch and we will investigate. Uh, we need to know if there's any any problems, if anyone has a problem getting hold of a book um, or, or anything like this, do let me know. Let us know, rather. Um, ah, yes, we're he hearing from Enzo again. Um no need to answer my last question. He's figured out what a moon bleed is. Well, I already did in the previous one, but well done. We knew you would, Enzo. We knew you would. Um, and this one from Ian. Ah, yes. Um, Ian would like two slips of paper with my autograph so he can stick it in the books. I'm afraid, Ian, I get a lot of these requests from all over the world. And if we said yes to one, then I'd have to do it to lots of people and I'd be forever going to the post office. So I'm afraid not. But if I'm ever doing a signing in your neck of the woods... I will sign book, pl book plates and that sort of thing. Well, we've got one from Yulia. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. She from Slovenia, who spoke such or wrote such brilliant English last time and asked great questions. And just saying thank you very much for my comments. Um, nice to have a repeat visitor. Um, and wondering if I'll include her idea in a real Chronicles book someday. I don't think I ever use other people's ideas knowingly. Um, so I think I'll leave that one for you, um, even if I do do another Chronicles book. We'll have to see. Now we've got one from Marshall um, and some lovely comments about Chronicles of Ancient Darkness, which is great. Um, yes, and some understanding comments about the fickleness of film financing. Thank you for that. And this is an interesting question. I don't think anyone's asked me this. Um, when you travel around the world on your author's vision quests, that's a lovely way of putting it, do you always travel alone or are you accompanied by one or uh, more other folks? If I can, wherever possible, Marshall, I travel on my own. Um, it's incredibly important to me to do that uh, because I have the characters with me. And, and as I said in the answer to a previous question, I'm experiencing the story. I do not want to be talking to someone else or have someone else say well what are we going to have to eat and that sort of thing you know I just really don't now there are times when of course I have to be with someone because I need a guide you know there are some places where you you can't go on your own um you can't find the way or it's dangerous or it's just illegal I mean when I climbed the um uh the volcano whose name escapes me um uh in Sicily it was illegal to climb that live volcano without a guide um, because there's a prescribed path and you get sued or something. But that aside, yeah, I do. And even if it gets a bit sort of dangerous or scary, that's part of that's part of the experience. Um, so yeah, because I don't really feel truly alone. Uh, I've got the characters with me. Lovely way to finish, Marshall. May the muse continue transmitting her creative inspirations to you. I really hope she does. <laughs> I really hope she does. But thank you. Now we have some, again, this is this is from Maddie. This is also about places. Um, lovely. You, your books feel so realistic to read. What was your favourite experience or place you've been to when you were researching a book? Um, 
I don't really have a favourite because I mean that I've had some wonderful experiences doing those books, um, chronicles, and also the ghost stories. But I think something that does come back to me when I get asked this question is swimming with killer whales, wild killer whales in North Norway, off the coast of North Norway. Um, it was November, it was freezing cold. It was an amazing day. I had to get up very early and put on loads of clothes and then this this dry suit. Well, I had to cover my hair in talcum powder just to sort of get it on because it was very, very tight. Because, uh, you know, you die in the water in a couple of minutes because it's so cold. And then swimming to begin with, you know, it was like I was a Michelin man, you know, I was sort of floating on the surface. But one of the things that struck me before I even saw the killer whales was just this beautiful green light, you know, swimming, floating in this green light. And it, I really got the sense of what it must be like to be a killer whale, you know, or a seal. You're just floating in light and it's, yay, you're having a whale of a time. And that has completely surprised me. Um, and that was before I saw the killer whale swimming underneath me and hearing him sort of whistling and clicking, echolocating, and then seeing him just speeding so quickly and the whole thing only probably only took a couple of seconds but it was really unforgettable so that was that was a very special moment and it was a great day anyway because going home going back to the little place where I was staying there were these huge cliffs with masses of eagles nests on top and these are the white-tailed sea eagles just masses of them um sort of wheeling around and flying and that gave me the idea for the eagle cliffs uh in spirit walker so <sighs> What a day. Um, now, Maddie, you also ask, are there any time periods and regions that you're tempted to write about? Well, I always go back to the ancient times, prehistory. Um, I do love the Stone Age. And I, I love the northern the northern forests and ice So and the sea. So that's what I tend to go back to i would like to write a story about a desert because i you know i'm really fascinated by deserts but i haven't yet had a good story <laughs> come into my head so there we go um now remy or oh, don't quite know how i pronounce that but um because you're swedish i think um wonderful account of how you know you read nothing else but the wolf brother series for an, a year and a half and um you gave talks gave a talk on wolves rights and and protecting wolves in sweden which is fantastic i'm not going to read the whole of this because it's quite a long long post um and then you found out that i'd written gods and warriors bronze dolken in swedish and you love them fantastic and now you're reading dark matter and thin air i think i made you cry yay sorry um and but you've got some questions so i'm going to rattle through your questions what do you think happened after Torek and ren started discovering new things um i don't want to you know, that's a really nicely coded question. I don't want to include a spoiler. Well, that's up to you for now. I may come back to Torek and Ren at some point, but for now, that's up to you. I'm not going to go into detail. What inspired you to write everything? Um, I think it goes back to my childhood. You know, I mean, I wanted a wolf when I was a child. I didn't get one. And I wanted to live like the Stone Age people. So I slept on my bed, on the floor, rather. I got rid of the bed and uh, grew all sorts of weird herbs and things. So childhood imaginings and then meeting a bear um, when I was growing up in the woods of Southern California, that, that helped because I was really scared. Um, I think I've, there's something, I talk about that in a bit more detail on my website. Another question, um, did you just love spending time with the wolves? Yes. Um, that actually, you know, Maddie asked me about um, what were the special times when I was researching. And of course, being with the wolves was some of the most special times. Um, in fact, I miss Torek. He's he's a, a wolf at the trust where I go for research. So I need to go and see him again. And spending time with the cubs when they were little, that was amazing. Um, I got to feed them their first rabbit. And I held this thing, and they were only little cubs, and I held this thing really high. And they had it off me. They just jumped straight up into the air in about 30 seconds flat. Uh, and then they were off, you know. And they were little cubs. It was amazing. Um, that was a nice question. How can you be so amazing? Well, oh, what a question. Um, hard work and planning is where those stories come from. Lots of it. Um, oh, this one. What was Torek's father's name? I'm not going to tell you. I'm never going to tell you. And I haven't written it down. So you're never going to find out. I think some things are best not 
said. And that's one of them. That's going to be a little mystery. Uh, now, this is one from Logan. Um, yeah, what does Torek wear? Well, I think I do describe it a little bit in Wolf Brother. He wears a jerkin, which is like a sort of shirt, but without a collar, um, and leggings, which are like sort of trousers, um, and boots. And he tends to then, when he goes on his travels, uh, he tends to get clothes from the clans that he's with. So when he's up in the far north, he's given a suit of clothes, you know, made of reindeer hide and, and seal hide underneath. Um, one of the things I really like is in Ghost Hunter at the end, he's wearing a sort of reindeer hide robe, as it were, over leggings um, with a belt, which looks amazing on him because he's quite slim. Um, so there are descriptions. Uh, but generally, I think because he's a, a hunter-gatherer, he's a hunter, what he wears blends into the landscape. That's what it's designed to do. So no flashy colours, no noisy jewellery, rattling sort of necklaces of bones or anything like that because that would go against him when he's hunting. So that's what he wears. Nice question. Uh, another one from, I think this may be the same Enzo, um, with an amazing picture. Uh, yes, there we go. Fantastic. This is a drawing of how you imagine a certain character. Can you guess which one? Well, I actually looked at this when I, I was having lunch with my agent and my wonderful publisher, uh, Fiona Kennedy, who edited and published th these books. And we all said Aostra. We just looked at it and said, it's got to be Aostra. So I really hope it is. Um, I suppose at a pinch it possibly could be Seshu, but it's obviously got to be Aostra. It's a great, great picture. You've got a good eye for design, actually, Enzo. Um, oh, and you've also asked, did you ever consider writing a prequel to Chronicles? Because um, you'd like to read about the Soul Eaters in more detail. I don't know, is the answer, because I actually don't like the idea. I'm, I'm not particularly attracted to prequels, because you know what's going to happen to them in the end. That's probably that but it hasn't really attracted me um the other thing is maybe a short story to give us a peek at the characters lives after the final book again enzo not a short story if i did pick up ren and torak and finkhead in and wolf it would be a book definitely um but thank you that that was an interesting question uh now yes here we are you've got and two final questions. Um, there's one question here from uh, Jonathan, um, who's Swedish, and it's an interesting one. It's about the religion um, in Torek's world. You, you, you've picked up certain elements of Germanic mythology, Norse paganism. Um, what gods and religions are they worshipping and sacrificing for, apart from the animals the clans are devoted to? Well, I mean, you're right to sort of pick up elements of the Norse um culture in the names and some of things like Torek has wolves and ravens that's a sort of aspect of Odin isn't it but it's not a Norse religion this is this is a much earlier type of religion so there are no gods as such I mean there's the world spirit but they don't worship the world spirit it's it's not like that it's more what they call animism so in Torek's world everything has Everything is alive, rocks, trees, rivers, um, animals. Not everything can talk, but everything can hear and think. I think somewhere that's said. I think it might be in the second book. So it's a little bit like the beliefs of the Inuit people, some of the um, Pacific Northwest tribes, the Shinto religion in Japan. It's a little bit like that, that the world is alive. And so, you know, this, there are spirits in everything. So... That's who you sacrifice to. You know, you sacrifice to the wind if you're up in the far north and that's because the wind is going to kill you otherwise. Um, so I hope that helps a bit. I mean, my, my idea was that um, Chronicles were sort of before the Norse religion, you know, the, before the world of Odin and Thor and those sort of people. So, you know, that's why there are elements. Torak has his wolves and his ravens, but um, it's not really God's. And goddesses that comes a little bit later which is why we have gods and warriors my other series 
Now, finally, um, that brings me, talking of Shinto and Japan, brings me neatly to the final question comment. This is wonderful. This is um, from Muso Zerokoma. I hope I've got that right. Muso Zerokoma, um, who is a sculptor in Japan and who's done some amazing sculptures inspired by Chronicles of Ancient Darkness. Uh, he's lived in the in, and worked in forests, um, so he knows forests very well, I believe. And you, he's going to have an exhibition in May 2018 um, to evoke the world of Northern Europe 6,000 years ago. Um, and so this is wonderful. And um, I'll try to give you just a little message um, so that please feel free to use this, you know, in, in your exhibition. Um, konnichiwa. Gomen nasai ni hongo wa dakimasen. So I will be speaking in English. Um, I'm thrilled and delighted and honoured that my books have inspired your sculptures. I find them incredibly evocative of Torak's world, the world of my hero, 6,000 years ago in Northern Europe, the Stone Age. I think during that time, Standing stones, what we call standing stones, uh, rocks, were believed to be alive. They're incredibly powerful in the landscape. Um, they were believed to have spirits and perhaps even to have hidden people in the world of my books, hidden people who live in the rocks. And that's what I get from your sculptures, that feeling that the land is alive with spirits. So again, um, thank you tremendously for getting in touch and I wish you every possible success with your exhibition and uh, thank you. Arigato gozaimasu. Well, there we go. And for those of you who don't speak Japanese, that first bit that I said is my only line of Japanese. It means I'm sorry I don't speak Japanese. Um, but again, thank you so much, everybody, for getting in touch. Um, that was a really fascinating I thought, um, collection. Sorry about all the rustling, but I'm trying to find my um, my list. But wonderful list, you know, a lot of questions. And um, if I haven't answered yours yet, please, um, I will, you know, be patient. I will next time, but I think we're up to date now. Uh, keep them coming. As I said, it's michellepaver.com slash ask. And of course, oh yes, there is still the, that video uh, competition. Uh, again, you can find follow the links on the website. Um, so keep the questions coming. And thank you very much. And I'll see you possibly just before Christmas. Okay, thanks. <laughs>